how did your how has your lab like evolved kind of from the start to where it is now and what role has data science and machine learning played in that? Yeah, so I mean my group has always had sort of as its core an interest in using mechanism uh, and reactivity to guide the design um, and development of catalytic methods and strategies. And certainly underlying that is an interest in physical organic chemistry, uh, very similar uh, to Matt's, you know, your group's interests. Um, and so clearly as part of understanding reactivity and mechanism, it's about using data, right, to whether it's kinetic traces or linear for energy relationships to try and understand reactivity and structure activity relationships. Um, and so, you know, that was always underlying in our early work, but our early work was certainly almost all experimental. Um, and then I think, you know, as we continued uh, over the, the past 10 years, I became more and more, and the group became more and more interested, but also dissatisfied in the way that we handle data, um, you know, both in how we use it to learn mechanism, but also just how we generate it and whether we could do better and use and develop tools that will allow us to use less data to learn more. Um, and so I think that's what drew us into yeah, more data science and ultimately the center. What do you think were the biggest obstacles that your group and like your students had to overcome in like learning it or applying it and kind of that situation? Yeah, I mean, I think there, there are probably a few. Um, you know, one that I've found in all of the cases where we've started to, uh, you know, look beyond sort of traditional synthetic chemistry is sort of a language barrier, uh, if you will. Um, I mean, I, I think we've, we saw this when we were in doing fluorination and then moving to do radio fluorination and radio chemistry. I think we've seen it in, in this case as well, sort of as, you know, physical organic chemists starting to adopt, you know, data science, machine learning approaches, is that there is this, yeah, sort of gap in how we speak about problems uh, that um, uh, you need to overcome and sort of learn the language of the other, you know, uh, the other field in order to be able to have conversations and understand how the two things can work together. Um, and that's something that uh, takes time, right? And reading and, you know, having conversations where you yeah, have to ask, I don't understand what you're saying, or I don't know what this <laughs> word means. Um, and, you know, I think we see this, you know, in our field as well, right? There are probably 10 different words that we use to describe, right? A substrate or a catalyst. And so someone who's not in our field will look at us, you know, like, yeah. what does that mean? <laughs> or, you know, what are you trying to say precisely? And I think yeah. it was a similar thing when we were starting to learn more data science um, approaches. You know, another clear bird, uh, sort of hurdle is understanding computational chemistry um, since, um, that's something that we rely heavily on in the center, right, as mm -hmm. a means of describing molecules so that you can start to, you know, build these sorts of models. Communication, um, I mean, it's a barrier in a lot of aspects of chemistry and science in general. Do um, you think that's one of the, for like groups that aren't really, um, are more hesitant to using data science and kind of applying that into their workflow, um, what do you think would be like a good, um, I guess, sell, selling pitch to overcome like the barriers to implementing it, if that made sense. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that it's really important. I hope that's one of the main um, outcomes of our center, right, is this ability to bridge that gap and communicate and demonstrate how useful these tools can be. And, you know, my sense is, is that, you know, the proof is in the pudding. So, I think one of the best ways we can convince right other groups to use this, and I think you know your lab has been doing a great job at this, is right to show how these tools and approaches can be useful for synthetic chemists. Um, you know, there's certainly still that barrier of learning, you know, aspects of coding, right, or at least how to. I'll look at existing code and use it, even if you're not gonna sort of de novo write your own right code. Um, so I think that, you know, the community has to be willing, right, to, you know, 
take at least a few steps, right, to uh, embrace this. Um, but the first step from our end and from the center's end is really to show how useful this can be as a tool and that it, you know, augments what we want to do and what we can do as, you know, chemists uh, yeah. already. What does good or data mean to you in your lab? Yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's a great question. And certainly data is both experimental data, computational data. Um, I mean, I do think and I hope that, you know, our community is going to change significantly in how we, you know, generate, share, report data um, in, you know, the next 10 years. Um, I think that it really, um, it's an important thing that we need to do and we, you know, as a synthetic chemistry community, we really lag behind how a number of other scientific fields treat our data. Um, and so this, you know, certainly if we can do that, then the tools that, you know, the center is building, the ability to generate tools that are really gonna help chemists, you know, make functional molecules uh, will be possible. But, you know, one of the big things we struggle with, you know, as a center is availability of data, yeah. right? Um, and, um, and, you know, good data, right? So data that's, you know, reproducible, that actually spans, right, a significant chemical space and demonstrates diversity and response that's necessary in order to build, you know, statistically meaningful, uh, you know, models. Um, but it definitely starts with the ability of our community to report, uh, right, data and to publish, you know, data in a way that is accessible to people who are trying to use it. What do you say to um, the sentiment that computers are coming for our jobs and will be replaceable? Yeah, I mean, I think this is just a case of, right, inflating what is really a non-issue. Um, you know, I, I would say that people who can use computers are coming for the job, <laughs> right? people who can't use computers. Um, but, um, but, you know, these, you know, I think which has been said sort of by other members of the center, it's, it's a tool, right? And it's something that is going to help facilitate our research, um, allow us to be you know, more creative, to do uh, things more efficiently, to learn from our data in ways that we currently don't. Um, but it's not a replacement for anything, you know, that we otherwise are doing. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, I'm very excited about the opportunities that it offers, but not because it's replacing, you know, uh, the most important parts of <laughs> our job and, you know, what we do. What was the best advice that you were ever given, either in grad school or um, in, after grad school? Oof. Um, I don't know if I can come up with one, but I'll tell you. I <laughs> we'll take multiple. <laughs> um, certainly one uh, is for, especially for, well, it works for graduate school and certainly for independent career, mm -hmm. is that, you know, you're in charge of your own success. Um, uh, so and that doesn't mean that you're alone in, you know, governing that success. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Um, you know, I think another piece of advice is you're surrounded by, right, an incredibly talented, uh, yeah, diverse, really broad and deep pool, right, of yep. colleagues, both in your lab and in the department. Mm -hmm. And so not making use and not really drawing from that talent is also a real waste. Um, yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, having, you know, the taking the time, right, to share data and thoughts and brainstorm ideas, uh, to learn new techniques from, you know, coworkers is, you know, really important. And especially graduate school is one of these amazing times, right, to, uh, to learn and to learn from people is as important as learning, you know, from reading the literature and executing experiments as well. Um, so, yeah, those two things, you know, really sort of taking advantage of the community around you, uh, but also recognizing that your success is in your own hands and, um, you know, that, and I find that especially in graduate school, that's not supposed to happen on day one, clearly. Um, but, um, but, you know, it does happen at some point throughout. And once that clicks 
And, you know, I think it makes a huge difference in terms of um, success and becoming an independent scientist. Um, so I'd say those are probably, those are at least two uh, that I'd say, and I think they apply for both, uh, you know, graduate school and for, um, you know, starting an academic position and an industry position as well.